snow to you. Welcome and feast day of St. Patrick. Our friend Seamus showed up, uh, you know, chair emeritus of the Royal Society of, what was it, Iberians or something? Uh, uh, so I can tell we have a few folks in this place who are honorary or actual Irish descent. Uh, I'm not, so it's, sorry, but uh, we can use a part of a prayer of St. Patrick this morning, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Uh, you might recognize this as, as a, a song that we sing occasionally. This prayer of St. Patrick has been put to, to a hymn. So, as I rise today, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arrive, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in the eye that sees me. Christ in the ear that hears me. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, so last week we were looking at the book of Judith, and hopefully we'll finish the book of Judith that quick. Uh, one of the books in that extra section of the Bible, and so basically let's pick up the storyline, uh, chapter 6 of the book of Judith. Now, in the story, and it's the storyline is is not uh, to be believed historically, okay? Uh, but the Assyrian army, under the command of uh, a man named Paul of Paris, well, you should put this up here because they would retaliate big time. Paul of Paris. Now, it's identified as the Assyrian army, and yet, uh, in the background, uh, is King Nebuchadnezzar. Well, he wasn't Assyrian at all, huh? Right? Right. Now, if you can... Nazar. Yeah. So, but, but like someone mentioned over here, he was a Babylonian king. So, you know, the, the history is off. Now, on the other side, we have, uh, we're going to have Judith. Judea is uh, the land that all of her furnace, Fernius is uh, commander of this great big group, and it's sweeping down from the north and the northeast uh, into the uh, northern plain of of uh, the land of Judah. Now, we will also find here a person who will play a small role of uh, Boaz and over here in Judah a man named 
Antioch. Also in the Judean camp, we will see Uzziah, who is like the leader of the town that's being besieged. Now, the main Judean town is Bathulia. And the whole story wraps around the besiegement of that town. Now, uh, An Ankior was a, really a mercenary that was attached to this uh, Assyrian army. And in chapter uh, 5, he comes to uh, to to Holofernes, Fernes, uh, the Assyrian commander, uh, because Holofernes wants to know about these Judeans. Uh, what are they like? So Ankior, leader leader, it says of the uh, Ammonites. Ammonites, you know, uh, I said yesterday or, or last week. You think Ammon, Jordan. Okay, so that was the area of the Ammonites. Um, and he gives, a, in chapter 5, a, a quick rundown of the history of the Israelite people. And uh, it makes the point that uh, they, they worship only one God, <coughs> the Father of Heaven, God of Heaven, as he is called. Well, this uh, sets off all the furnace in his cords uh, because they re represent the Buchanan who is self-proclaiming himself as God of the world above all other gods. And basically uh, this huge army, this huge force commanded by all the furnace is you know, spreading, it, it's about them spreading that and conquering in the name of King, King Nebuchadnezzar. So, uh, after Agior gives that report to Hall of Furnace and says, you know, that this people, uh, they have a, their God who fights for them and they've never been defeated, uh, defeated uh, we look at chapter 6. When the noise of the crowd surrounding the council have subsided, Holofernes, commander in chief of the Assyrian army, said to Ankior, in the presence of the whole throng of coastal peoples, there's a lot of Mid Eastern exaggeration in here. Okay. Uh, who are you, Ankior, to prophesy among us, as you have done today, and to tell us not to fight against the Israelites because their God protects them? What God is there besides Nebuchadnezzar? Uh, that's kind of a key thing. And we, we think, you know, you fast forward during the Jesus time, each of the Roman emperors at Jesus time you know, declared themselves to, right? Divine Augustus Caesar, you know. So, verse 5. As for you, may... Uh, Ankior, you Ammonite mercenary, you, for saying these things in a moment of perversity, you shall not see my face after today until I have taken revenge on this race of people from Egypt. Uh, then in my turn, the sword of my army or the spear of my servants will pierce your sides and you shall fall among their slain. Now get the heck out of here. Okay. Basic. So what he has in verse 10, he ordered his servants to take uh, seize Ankior and conduct him to the foothills overlooking this town, Bethulia, the Judean town. They have him bound up and uh, they take him out to send him up to the Israelites. Now, when the Israelites see this uh, cohort coming 
it says that from the top of the mountain range, they start slinging stones on them. Okay? And so the, the cohort of the army, they run away and they just leave that poor Anki over there all bound up like this, all bound up by the springs, the water source for the town. Well, the Israelites come down, they take them, and they take them up into their town of Bethulia, uh, uh, and in council, and that's where Uzziah comes in, he's one of the main councilmen of the Judeans, uh, he gives them basically a, a report of the army of the Assyrians. And so, uh, after he gives his report, uh, all the people in Bethulia, the Israelite people, uh, fall down, they prostrate, they worship God, and we get their prayer at the end of chapter eight, or at chapter 6 and verse 18. Uh, and the whole night long they, they pray and so on. Uh, chapter 7 opens up and, and they're the Assyrians are plotting how they're, they're, they're going to go about this, how to uh, besiege these, because the, the, the mountain range, uh, uh, evidently, the Thulia is, okay, let's get situated. We'll do a little, little biblical geography here, okay? Just below the Sea of Galilee, going almost straight out to the Mediterranean Sea is a flat, fertile plain uh, called the Plain of Ezrela. Okay? And it's, I forget, you know, 15, 20 miles wide, about 40 miles long. The Judean mountains come in just south of it, and there were a lot of battles fall fought on this plain. Okay? Um, earlier it was called the Plain of Jezreel. The mountains uh, just to the north of it are the mountains uh, where Nazareth, the home of Jesus, is and so on. Now, I don't know if they have Bethulia on here. Bethulia was right in here somewhere, one of the high peaks overlooking the plain of Ezra. Now, the way this is described, the Assyrian army is spread out at encampment on that plain. Now, there's a lot of water sources, and there was also food supplies. So, uh, Chapter 7, verse 8, all the commanders of the Edomites and all the leaders of the Ammonites. Now, okay, so the story just got done saying Anchior was the leader of the Ammonites. But they kicked them out of the camp and sent them up to the Judeans. So who's going to be the commander, who's the leader of the Ammonites, if their leader they sent to the enemy? That, a lot of things don't match up, see Right? But that's not important for the story. Stop thinking like a you know twentieth century person reading a newspaper article and trying to figure out who really has the truth. Huh? Yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is like CNN. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so uh, uh, you don't have to understand it. It's just all the. It's coming late. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we didn't even get introduced to Judith yet. They we're halfway through the darn book. Uh, but the commanders come and they say, uh, listen to a hollow furnace. Sir, listen. And they propose something because they had dropped off this Anchior. They said, we saw it. There's a, there's a spring. The main water source is outside the city. It's, it's not up there on the hill. It's down below. If we just go and, and, and control their water source, you know, in you know, a, a few days or a few weeks, 
we'll dry them out, <laughs> we'll starve them out, and so on. We don't have to lose any troops. So all the furnace said, oh, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Go, go back to the water source. And so they do. All right? So, now. Meantime, and this is the way the story goes. It, it's, it switches from the Assyrian camp back into the town up on the hill of Bethulia. Huh? And before chapter 7 uh, finishes, uh, we have the assembly uh, in Bethulia. Uh, evidently, they, they can't get to their water source anymore. Uh, they, they've been uh, starving out for over 30 days, it says. Uh, in verse 20, chapter 7, verse 20, the whole Assyrian army, infantry, chariots, cavalry, kept them thus surrounded uh, for 34 days. All the reservoirs of water failed the inhabitants of Bethulia, and the cisterns all dried up, so that on no day did they have enough to drink, but their drinking water was rationed. Their children fainted away, the women and youths were consumed with thirst, and were collapsing on the streets and the gateways of the city with no strength left in them. And all the people, therefore, uh, came, uh, went as a crowd, and they came to Uz Uzziah and the rulers of the city, and they set up a great clamor before the elders, uh, and they proposed, you know, why don't we just surrender to this army so we can get a drink of water? Okay? So, Uzziah, uh, fast forward down to verse 29, all in the assembly with one accord broke into thrill, wailing, and loud cries, wailing and weeping, and gnashing of teeth to their God. And Uzziah said, Courage, my brothers, let us wait five days more for the Lord our God to show his mercy toward us. And we will not, uh, we will not utterly forsake us. He will not utterly forsake us. But if those days pass without help coming to us, I will do as you say. And then he dispersed everyone throughout the city. Now, finally, verse 8. Chapter 8. Thank you. Comes Judith. Who will be the instrument of God. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it gives us a, a little description of her. She uh, has been faithful even after she's a young widow. Uh, it, it indicates her husband, verse 2, Manasseh, uh, of her tribe and clan, had died in the barley harvest. He was out in the fields supervising those, binding up the sheaves, and he suffered sunstroke. Had a stroke. He died of his illness, and he was buried in his forefather's field, and, and so on. The widow Judith remained three years and four months at home, for she set up a tent for herself on the roof of the house. She put on sackcloth about her loins and wore a widow's weeds. I don't know what that is, but uh, she fasted all the days of her widowhood, except Sabbath eves and. and and Sabbaths, uh, and she was beautifully warm and lovely to behold. Her husband Manasseh had left her gold and silver and servants and maids. So she was married to a rich man, but no one had a bad word to say about her, verse 8, for she was a very God-fearing woman. So she's, she's praised, you know, she's physically beautiful, uh, a poor widow lady, uh, wealthy, the way it's described. Huh? Uh, she's got everything going for her except uh, her husband. Uh, but all of a sudden, she she comes forward, hearing you know what they are plan what they are planning on doing, uh, and. She had harsh words for all the people uh, because of their lack of faith. And so the elders came to her. 
And he and she proposes, starting in verse 11, Listen to me, you rulers of the people of Bethlehem. What you said to the people today is not proper. When you promised to hand over the city to the enemies at the end of five days, unless within that time the Lord comes to your aid, you interpose between God and yourselves this oath which you took. Who are you then? <clears throat> that you should have put God to the test this day, setting yourselves in the place of God in human affairs. Now, the wording here, the wording here, what Judas says to the leaders of the city, they, they parallel what the commander of the Assyrian army said to Ancior. Who are you to tell us and prophesy to us. Get out of here. He kicked, he, he kicked him out. huh? Right? So these words are almost parallel. Alright? And, and Holofernes, he represents King Nebuchadnezzar who is setting himself up as God. as a god of the, of the, of the whole world. And setting his armies to conquer the whole world so that he can be the and Hancho, the God of the whole world. And here this woman is speaking on behalf of God to her leaders and saying, who are you then to put God to the test and, and to come between God's plan and so on? Well, she prays to Almighty God and she has a plan. And it comes to her. Uh, and her plan uh, Let's see, where is it? Verse 32. Listen to me. I will do something that will go down from generation to generation among the descendants of your race. I'm in chapter 8, verse 32. Stand at the gate tonight and let me pass through. And within the days you have specified, five days, remember, five days, five days, uh, before you surrender the city to the enemies, the Lord will rescue Israel by my hand. You must not inquire into what I am doing, for I will not tell you until my plan has been accomplished. So Uzziah and the rulers say to her, Well, go in peace. May the Lord of God be, be with you to take vengeance upon our enemies. And then with, they withdrew and went to their post. So most of chapter 9 then is Judas' prayer to Almighty God. It's very, very edifying, okay? So, uh, we're not going to go into breaking down the prayer, but it, it very, very, very much reflects uh, her spiritual strength and the source of her spiritual strength. So, what is her plan? What does she plan to do? Well, she puts aside, she puts aside her widow's garb, uh, and look at chapter 10. As soon as Judith had concluded her prayer, she rose from the ground. She called her maid and went down into the house. She took off the sackcloth. She had laid aside the garments of her widowhood. She washed her body with water anointed it with rich ointment. She arranged her hair, bound it up with a fillet. Yeah, I, you know what? What does it say? She bound her head up with what? Diadem? Oh, with a diadem. Yeah. Okay, a crown, you know. Beauty queen. Go on, crown. I don't know what the old translation is. You can't find it? I can find it, but there isn't any of anything. Does it? It's bound up her head. Oh, it, it just says bound up her head. Okay. So, and she put on festival, uh, festive uh, attire that she had worn while her husband was living. She chose sandals for her feet. She put anklets and bracelets and rings and, and earrings and uh, all other jewelry. And, and she made herself very beautiful to cap. Uh, captivate the eyes of all the men she would see. And then she gave her, her maid a leather flask of wine and, and uh, a 
cruise of oil and fill the bag with roasted grain and fig, uh, fig cakes and bread and cheese and all those provisions she wrapped up and gave to her maid to carry and they went out to the city gate and left the city gate and went down the hill. So that must have been quite a sight, huh? This, this gal all dressed up like a beauty queen with her maidservant carrying a sack of provisions coming down the hill. Now, the question is going to, well, there's a number of questions. Will she sneak into the enemy camp? Will she allow herself to be captured? How shall she preserve herself all decorated up like a beauty queen and, and such and going into an enemy army camp. You think some of those boys are lonely? How will the enemy troops respond to her? Well, we fast forward to uh, chapter 11. Oh, uh, no. Uh, chapter 10, verse 11. As Judith and her maid walked directly across the valley, they encountered the Assyrian outpost. And the men took her in custody, asked her all kinds of questions. What's she doing? And she, and she said, I, I've come to see Holofernes, the general in chief of your forces, to give him a trustworthy report. I will show him the route to which he can ascend to take possession of the whole mountain district without a single one of his men suffering injury or loss of life. So she's lying. Of course, that's what spies do, right? Huh? And what's a female spy called? Isn't there a term for that? Uh, Isn't there a special term for a female spy? <coughs> Chavis, you must know. Mata Hari. Huh? Mata Hari. Mata Hari? Mata Hari. Mata Hari? She was a spy during the First World War. Mata Hari. Okay. Well, basically, that's what uh, uh, almost uh, Judith becomes. So, now, verse 14. When the men heard her words and gazed upon her face, which appeared wondrously beautiful to them. Uh, they said, by coming down this, thus properly to, promptly to see our master, you have saved your life. Now go to his tent. Some of our men will accompany you to present you to him. Yeah, I bet they wanted to accompany him. Uh, there was no, uh, you know, no dearth of, volunteers to accompany her. Huh? Uh, so they detailed a, a hundred of their men to escort her and her maid and conduct them to the tent of Holofernes. And news, news of her spread among the tents and a crowd gathered in the camp. And they came and they stood around her as she waited outside the tent of Holofernes while he was being informed about her. You talk. Okay, here's the first indication of a Twitter account. <laughs> she, her appearance, set the whole army camp into a Twitter. Huh? Uh, that's how they responded. But, how will how the furnace responds? Well, you know, it kind of clo closes off. Uh, uh, <coughs> She was ushered into his tent, uh, and she prostrated herself, and immediately he saw her. She said, get up, you know. Uh, she says to, he says to his servants, uh, they marvel at the beauty of her face. Uh, and, and, you know, ch chapter 11 starts out, she, he says, take courage, lady, have no fear in your heart. Never have I harmed anyone who chose to serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of all the earth, and so on. And he goes on and on about Nebuchadnezzar. Now, uh, but, you know, the question is, what the heck are you doing, lady? Why are you here? Okay.
So she answers, listen to my words, my, my servant, me. And, and basically, she relays to him, uh, uh, first of all, praising him up, stroking his ego, so to speak. Uh, acknowledge, she acknowledges in her speech, in, in chapter 11, uh, the report that Angior, who was expelled from the, the army camp, had given to the Council of Bethulia, uh, and uh, she relates everything to uh, this. Uh, we drop down to, to verse 16 in chapter 11. As soon as I, your handmaid, learn all this, I fled from them. God sent me to perform with you such deeds that the people throughout the world will be astonished to hear. Your handmaid is indeed a God-fearing woman, serving the God of heaven night and day. So she affirms her faith, right, in the Lord God, the God of the Israel. Now I will remain with you, my Lord, but each night your handmaid will go out to the ravine and pray to God. And he will tell me when the Israelites have committed their crimes, then I will come and let you know so that you may go out with your whole force, and not one of them will be able to withstand. And, and I will lead you through Judea until you come to Jerusalem, and there I will set up your judgment seat, and you will drive them like sheep uh, without a shepherd. Uh, and not even a dog will growl at you. <laughs> and this, this was told me and announced to me in advance, and I in turn have, have been sent to tell you, now, these words really please Oliver. Okay? He's not going to lose any of his army. This beautiful woman's going to help them by pleading to her God. So, yeah, here's the irony of this. Okay? So, this army general who is representing someone who calls him the king of the whole world and, you know, uh, the God of the whole world, he listens to this prophecy of this woman because she's a beautiful woman because she's a beauty queen and not only that but this strong you know commander of this great army says okay whatever you say girl okay we'll we'll let you do and she he he, he gives her sends out the command you know Make sure she and her handmaid, she has to go out at midnight and pray every night to their God and so on. And then, and then she's going to report back to me, you know, what, the, what their God says. She's like a conduit to God and so on. Uh, your handmaid is indeed a God-fearing woman. <laughs> I mean, the, the whole irony of this situation swings on that identity, her self-identification <coughs> of being, uh, you know, now, uh, what happens? Uh, her speech pleases Holofernes. He definitely wants her to stay in the camp. Three nights and three days, she and her maid established this pattern of going out at midnight, okay, with their own bag of provisions and everything, and with, with with the general's permission, all right, and escort to pray to God. The fourth day, Holofernes, for some reason, throws a great banquet, a great big party. Now, he doesn't invite his, his, his commanders and chiefs. It just with his staff, it says not his officers, uh, and now we get another person that's introduced, uh, Bagoas, his eunuch who serves him, Bagoas. And uh, he, he, he makes sure everything is proper. No one approaches the commander that isn't supposed to be uh, doing that. So he sends uh, Bagoas to invite Judith and her maid to his party. Uh, well, they, they said, uh, you know, 
Okay, so she gets all gussied up. With well, what do you think that commander has on his mind? He doesn't have his army generals. He doesn't have his, his military leaders with him. He just has his private staff, uh, you know, with him. He sends his eunuch a special invitation to this beauty queen, you know, come on to my party. And, you know, what's he going to do? Well, chapter 12, he starts the party. And what does he do? He gets all snockered up. Huh? He gets the... And, uh... Verse 19. She then took the things her maid had prepared and ate and drank in his presence. No, she ate and drank her own food. While the furnace charmed by her. I don't know what other translations have. This is kind of... You know, He's more than charmed by her. He drank a great quantity of wine, more than he had ever drunk in a single day in his life. And when it grew late, the servants quickly withdrew, and Bagoas closed the tent from the outside and excluded the attendants from their master's presence. They went off to their beds. They were all tired from the prolonged banquet. Judith was left alone in the tent with Holofernes, who lay prostrate on the bed, for he was sodden with wine. She had ordered her maid to stand outside the bedroom and wait, as on other days, for her to come out. She said they would be going for their evening prayer. And Bagoas, to a Bagoas, she had said this also. So when all was said and done, and everyone was away, and she was in the mid-bed uh, mid chamber, and this guy drunk on it, so what is she going to do? In verse 6 of chapter 13, she went to the bedpost near the head of all the furnace, taking his sword from him. She drew close to the bed. She grasped the hair of his head. She prayed, strengthen me this day, O God of Israel. And then with all her might, she struck him twice in the neck and cut off his neck. Cut off his head from the neck. And she rolled the body off the bed and she took the canopy from its support. Soon afterwards, she came up she handed the head over to her maid, who put it in the food pouch. Remember that food pouch? You know, you know. Earlier in the story, you, you might have thought, oh, "Why are they bringing all their food? You know, why, why, why is she bringing a shopping basket?" Well, guys, guys. Now we know why women carry big purses. <laughs> Now we know the real reason why women carry big purses. <laughs> the old translation says, put it in her wallet. That's what we call a wallet now, I guess. Well, it shrunk. It shrunk. No, it was a food box. So. And, then, and then, you know, they were able to leave the enemy camp because they had established that as their prayer pattern, right? But instead of going to the, their usual place, they go up the hill to the town, the Israelite town. And when they get to town, the Bethulia, uh, passing through the ravine, uh, they call for the council, Uzziah and his councilmen of the city, and, you know, the maid brings the basket, and she says, you know, like, look what I got here. She pulls the head of Holofernes off, the head of the commander, out of her food bag. You think she washed it and used it after that? No. But, you know, to confirm that it is the commander's head, they call Ankior, you know, the former, and they call him 
basically to you know identify is is this really the head? And when he sees the head of the commander, he faints. He dead faints away. You know he, he can't believe it. So what are they going to do next? Okay, they got the head. Well, here. Here, uh, in verse 14, Then Judith said to them, Listen to me, brothers. Take this head, hang it on the parapet of the wall of the city. The high point of the wall of the city. And at daybreak, when the sun rises on the earth, let each of you seize his weapons. Let all the able-bodied men rush out of the city under command of your captain, as if about to go down onto the plain against the advance of the guard of the Assyrians, but without going down. And they will seize their armor, they will hurry to their camp, and awaken their generals. And when they run to the tent of Holofernes, and do not find him, panic will seize them, and they will flee before you. Then you will have, and all the inhabitants of the territory of Israel will pursue them and strike them down in their tracks. So she gives them the battle plan. Prior woman comes right and so they do that and they follow basically her orders all right and and when the Assyrian army this, this must have just went out ah. so thank you So, so, can you hear me now? Okay. So, when the Assyrian army uh, sees the citizens up on the ridge of the hill, all standing there for battle, battle ready, uh, they go in, they send uh, the commanders, uh, you get uh, Olafertus, our, our grand leader, uh, the unit goes in and he finds the headless body, and no Hebrew women around. And what happens next? I mean, you can read it for yourself. Verse uh, 14, panic. What happens next is the whole Assyrian army is thrown into a panic. The whole army just goes away. Now, one of the things, because they identified the commanders uh, that were drawn in by Uzziah, or by all the furnace, as coming from uh, Edom and Ammon, the commanders of the Edomites and Ammonites, his army was basically a mercenary army. They weren't all Assyrians or Babylonians. They, they were a mercenary army. When they see that their commander is, you know, dead, off they go. They go back to their town. They get the heck out of there. And, you know, what the citizens of Bethulia do is summon the other Israelites. How do they do that? They got smoke signals. They summon the other Israelites to come on down and pursue what is left over of this so-called Assyrian army. And uh, chapter 15 uh, it says, On hearing the news, those still in their tents were amazed. They were all overcome with fear and trembling. These are the army guys, uh, the Assyrian army. No one kept ranks any longer. They scattered in all directions. They fled along every road, both along the valley and in the mountains. And those also who were stationed on the mountain district around Bethulia, they took to flight. Then all the Israelite warriors overwhelmed them. And then it goes into you know some some details, uh, you know, conquering hero kind of things. 
Uh, verse 11 in chapter 50. For 30 days the whole populace plundered the camp, giving Judith the tent of Holofernes with all his silver, his couches, his dishes, and all his furniture, which she accepted. And she harnessed her mules, hitched her wagons to them, loaded these things on them. And all the women of Israel gathered to see her, and they blessed her and performed the dance in her honor. And she took branches in her hands and distributed them to the women. And uh, she and the other women crowned themselves with garlands and olive leaves, and then they sang a great prayer song. And chapter 6 is a great thanksgiving song, a great thanksgiving prayer uh, on the mouth of Judith. And it kind of, you read through this, and it kind of uh, would remind you in the history of Israel of, of the song of Miriam, you know, and that probably, portions of probably appear in that psalm that we use uh, at the Easter vigil. Horse and chariots being cast into the sea, you know. Uh, and, and, and it goes on and on like that about, you know, the great flight of, of Exodus out of the uh, part of the ancient song of the, uh, Miriam, the sister of Moses and and so this song of praise or hymn of praise of Judith is much like that. And it, it praises God for allowing them to capture their enemies uh, and uh, defeat uh, all the forces. Uh, what's the end of the story? Uh, well, if you take a look, chapter 16, verse 21. And when those days were over, so they, they party for you know, a month. When those days were over, each one returned to his inheritance. And Judith went back to Bethulia and remained on her estate. For the rest of her life she was renowned throughout the land. Many wished to marry her, but she gave herself to no man all the days of her life. And from the time of, of the death and burial of her husband, Manasseh, she lived to be very old in the house of her husband, reaching an advanced age of 105. And she died in Bethulia, where they buried her in the tomb of her husband. The house of Israel mourned her for seven days. Before she died, she distributed her goods to the relatives of her husband and to her own relatives and to the maid who gave her freedom. So, she was very generous then, you know, uh, throughout her life, from that time on, and um, greatly, greatly uh, honored. Now, on our outline, what lessons and themes do we learn from this? From, so, in this, you know, basically, if you take a look at this story, it's a very, it's, it's a short story. It, it appears here, you know, in 16 chapters, they probably could have had the whole, whole narrative and story in about three or four. But they have all these prayers and all this, you know, made up dialogue and, and, and you know, background kind of stuff. Right. What happens to <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar after all of this? We hear nothing of him. I mean, well, this was the God of the universe. Yeah, well, we, we, we know from... Well, where do we go from here? Well, we know from real history what happened. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, he's just inserted here. Uh, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, to... To give the story historical texture, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't he come back into uh, the story with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Uh, well, that's that. Uh, well, the question is, doesn't Nebuchadnezzar come back into the story with with the three Jewish men in the fiery furnace? That's another time period, and that's a book of Daniel. It, it's it's the same guy, but it's. It's like, it's like the Israelite people, all wisdom and wisdom literature came from Solomon. The, the Psalms came from King David. Did King David write all the Psalms? No. no. Did all the wisdom books come from King Solomon because he was blessed by God with great wisdom? No. no. Because a lot of the wisdom books and, and the Proverbs and so on come centuries after 
King Solomon lived. Okay. So Nebuchadnezzar is used because he was a great adversary and he conquered Jerusalem in 587 and burned down, destroyed their t temple and everything, took them off into exile for about 40 years and then, and then he was conquered by Persians yep. and the Persian kings allowed the Israelites to come back. So he is, he becomes a caricature of the worst enemy that Israel had at a certain time period in their history. They put him in the story so that they can illustrate what they're trying to say. They put him in the story to illustrate their main points. They're, you know, they're getting to their main point, some of their main points or themes. God of heaven, the God of Israel, is the master of history. Uh, and it comes through because uh, Judith prayed to Almighty God, right? And she was inspired through her prayer. Uh, and just as first with Moses and the Hebrews in the Passover, now with Judith is found. This is found in Judith's prayer that he, that their God is the God of heaven, the God and Master of history. Uh, Historical parallels to her prayers, and it's kind of compared to Simon and the slaughter of the uh, Shemites after they raped his sister Diana in the book of Genesis, chapter 4. Uh, there's high drama in this, but it's a woman, not a man, who saves Israel because of her resourcefulness her creativeness, her eloquence, her courage, her guileness. Uh, more than the leading men of Bethulia, they're ready to give up. They said five more days. Well, within that five-day period, the woman brought them salvation, right? And the only sword that was raised was the sword of the commander used to cut off his own head. Because he was a knucklehead and got drunk. Okay. Uh, the main weapon that she used as an instrument of Almighty God to save the people was her beauty. Uh, and she used it to the full. So, uh, further lesson of faith. Uh, she is portrayed a childless widow. She's portrayed as a mother of the faith for the Jews, for Judaism. And so by way of uh, extension, uh, she becomes like an Old Testament type. Remember I told you about type or model? It's something from the Old, the Old Testament that appears several times and then in the New Testament. So she becomes like a type for Mother Mary, uh, mother of Jesus who was a widow lady, right? And through her faithfulness and, and her prayer and perseverance, uh, her son brought salvation indeed to the whole world. So, here's a heroine. The heroine carries out the role assigned to her by culture and uses you know, her God-given, her natural God-given gift to bring salvation to all her people. So a, a, a story that, you know, some of our Christian friends who don't have the hidden book of Judith, where does that come from? Well, you can tell them. It's a great story, huh? And now you understand it a little bit well, more, huh? And we covered it very quickly. Roy? Yeah. Just going through the mind, of this... Judith and Esther and the women in the Bible also should bring us to a knowledge of how the Israelites changed as they were made enslaved by the various so-called rulers of the world. And the things we have today are also an effect of those incidents in history. Yeah. So, Bill? I noticed in chapter 3 when they talked about the death of her husband. Yeah. They said he was buried with his ancestors and like openly. 
But yet in Tobit, wasn't Tobit still burial was at night in the dark? Things like that. His, well, his, Tobit's dad had to bury people at night in the dark because there was a prohibition against burying Jewish people. When did that change from prohibited to openly? Uh, with, with the ruler. With the change of ruler and so on. Well, folks, next week uh, I'm going to uh, be out of town, but you have on your sheet, uh, sheets on your table, take it with you. Uh, we've had Abba Nicholas here before. Uh, those who were not here with Abbot Nicholas uh, should be a real treat. He is a, of the Greek Catholic uh, tradition, Byzantine Catholic. Uh, he looks like this. Uh, he's very eloquent, and it should be a very interesting. He's always interesting, isn't he? Yeah. So bring bring your friends, okay, and then bring them back next week, the week after too. Thank you very much for coming, everyone.